Okay, folks. Welcome to Green Duck. Thanks for coming today. Um, first day I'll... Oh, actually, I should introduce myself. My name's Tony Lewis. I've come from uh, Camera. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for the campaign for VLL. Um, I'll introduce the uh, audience. We have uh, Wilf Nelson, who's currently playing with his... Hello. <laughs> <laughs> MD of uh, Salopian. What he doesn't know about Carscal isn't worth knowing, quite frankly. <laughs> we also have Pete Brown. Pete Brown, journalist, broadcaster. Say hello. Oh, hello. Um, he's a fan of quality Carscal, I believe. And he's also, obviously, I would say that, right? And he is also the chair of the of the uh, British Gu uh, Guild of uh, Beer uh, Writers, Jaeger Wise. Um, she is the um, head brewery of Wildcard Wildcard Brewery, and um, officially she is the Seaboat Regional Director as well. And she sings, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, and congratulations! I believe you just won Brew of the Year. Uh, right. Roger Protz, most people know Roger, you know, um, I'm sure you know, I don't need to do much re-research on Roger. He is uh, a prominent voice of beer, and he's written wonderful books, uh, published by Camera, by the way, if you go to <laughs> www. Um, he, is also, he has been the um, previous chair of uh, British Beer Writers, haven't you? And also, um, also edited the uh, Good, Good Beer Guide. Uh, we've got Roberto Ross. Roberto Ross uh, currently works for Green Duck. We're here today. He is a beer sommelier. I, actually, I asked a friend about uh, Roberto, and, and he said um, he went along to one of Roberto's um, tastings down in Coventry and said, I didn't know beer had so many stories. He just opened the world. It was thoughtful and insightful, so well done. Um, we also have here today Sam... I'm going to struggle here. Sam McGarrigal, 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 yes. Sam is um, MD of Beer Docks, uh, Beer Dock Bars, which have bars in Crewe, Northwich as well. Yeah, and Leek, yeah. His love of beer was influenced by his dad and also by your time in Nottingham, no doubt? Uh, yeah, spent a lot of time yeah. in, uh, in, uh, yeah. in drinking beer. Welcome. And uh, we have Lally Morrison. Lally Morrison was um, head brewer of um, Mad Hatter, which is sadly um, uh, gone by the wayside, which I know everyone said that. But you've actually just got a new role now, haven't you? At, at Glen, Glen, Glen Afric, Afric which is in uh, Birkenstead. Birkenhead. Birkenhead, <laughs> in Liverpool, I believe. Just yeah. next door. Oh, next door to Liverpool. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm from down south, right? <laughs> you're, you're doing your best. You're doing your best. As far as I'm concerned, everything past Watford <laughs> is, is just, it's just there. Okay. And uh, finally, but not least, is Ian Clark. Ian Clark is um, actually, I've, I've found this wonderful quote Boom came the sound of thunder, and the rain came down like beads bouncing from the mash tun. Wild weather owls. <laughs> was born. Introduce him. The Ryan Hanley. <laughs> it's all bullshit to me. <laughs> you wrote it, didn't you? Did you? <laughs> well, I loved it. I loved it. Right, OK. And, and no doubt you've hosted camera members in your uh, brewery as well. Yeah. How did you find that? Good? Yeah, uh, yeah they were yeah. there. Good on you. All right. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so... <laughs> the first topic of the day... Um, and, in fact, we've got three topics, uh, just to quickly recap. The first one is um, around, you know, quality car scale. Have we turned the corner? Yes, no. That's something for us to uh, discuss. Plus, we've got another conversation around pubs are closing, breweries are closing. What's the root cause behind that? Okay. And the first one, which we will cover, is around tap rooms, festivals. What makes a good tap room? What makes a good festival? Is it brewery led festivals? Is it volunteer led festivals like the ones which Camera so ably runs? So, <laughs> <laughs> I 
over to the audience. In this case, I'd like to start with someone who runs a tap room. Who runs a tap room? Yeah, you, you run a tap room, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is tap room? So, in terms of a brewery tap room, we've one of the big lessons we've learned over the years. So, we opened up our Ravenswood tap room in 2013 and we've just opened up our, our new tap room in 2018. And one of the things that we found, it, uh, especially with breweries in an industrial estate, is people need to be warm. <laughs> people don't really stick around and they don't really spend much money if they're freezing. And that is a massive, massive challenge in a industrial size building. So we have, we've spent a lot of time, a lot of money to make sure that in the winter time, it's not freezing. People don't have their coats on. So I would say that's kind of top tip number one. Number two, I would say events. It's all about events. Um, in London, it's very competitive. There's, there's lots of people doing lots of things, lots of pubs you're competing with. So to get people through, through the door, you have to be doing events. And you, ha you have to be doing different things. Um, so we do sp spend a lot of time doing that. Um, the other thing I would say is old school methods of advertising. So things like flyering has been really, really great for our tap room. Um, yes, we use a lot, a lot of social media to bring people down. But I think the general lesson learned is if you open the door, I don't think the people come. Like you have to work quite hard to get the people to come. Um, and if, if it works, it can work really, really well. But it, th there is a <coughs> concerted effort yeah. um, to, to, to make it work. And that's an interesting point in terms of what, what do people want? What's the experience they're looking for when they go to a tap room or a beer festival? Has that changed in the past, uh, compared to the past? Will, do you have any views on that? It's difficult for me to, to actually give you an objective comment on this because whilst we have a tap room it's it's not a commercial tap room so when you, if we just look at the, the the question on a tap room i would have thought the the most important thing in a tap room for a brewery is inclusion that that you're looking that your people that support you that, that love your beers come to drink your beer at your bar you should make them as welcome as possible and and to, as much as you can give them what they want. In terms of beer festivals, I, I, beer festivals are, I was about to use the word an anathema, but they're not an anathema. They, they, they're, they're a great institution in their own right. I don't see that the way they operate now is particularly different to when I started in beer 20 years ago. Um, there is, as Jaeger said, I think a, a lot of uh, to, to drive a successful beer festival, I think there needs to be more than just beer, and so it's, it's making it slightly different. But at the end of the day, I think it's beer that people go for, and and that's the way most festivals work. Mm -hmm. As I said, I don't feel particularly well qualified to discuss yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll jump in on beer festivals. I think <laughs> beer festivals these days is because we've got such a, a good diversity of beer in the UK. I think beer festivals need to embrace that a little bit more. I mean, I think we've all been to we've all been to beer festivals where it's it might as well be 20, 30, 100 casks, uh, sometimes even more than that in, in certain beer festivals that are basically 3.8 brown, very similar beers. Um, so it's, it's I think beer festivals need to sort of get on board with um, with finding people that know a bit about beer and getting them to do the ordering, rather than just going right. I'll I'll almost cherry pick beers that I think will sell to the masses uh, and get people to pick beers that maybe would be a little bit out there um, so we get so we get 40 beers that maybe are a little bit different rather than 40 beers that are all very similar yeah. and Ian I mean you you're you're one about choice aren't you I uh, I think um, as a side note the environment beer festivals are held in is quite a um, quite a telling point I mean um, I was talking to someone the other day and our camera led volunteer festival is held at a rail heritage museum that's got one of the first trains that went on its side and it, it, it's a lovely place but uh, you compare that with the independent beer festivals that are held in old factories and um, the Victoria Baths for Indie Man uh, and the environment is just so <coughs> much more welcoming than appealing to a crowd that wants literally wants to come and look at trains and I mean, you've got the Barrow Roundhouse one as well um, and I think although there were probably a great use of the space 
once upon a time for, for a demographic and for, for a, a customer base. Unfortunately, that customer base is now so diluted that it's not just... I mean, I, I, I literally couldn't care about trains and going to look at it. I'd much, much rather focus on the beer and, and have, it, have everything else. Um, there probably is a core market that does want both of it, um, but then there's such a, an expanded market that wants, wants much more out of the venue than just um, a place to go. I mean, the thing you can see it is city centres. Um, obviously, they have these old buildings that aren't being used and they have all the... Uh, they have everything at their... their their hands mm. um, whereas little towns like Crewe and places like that obviously just need to find somewhere that is appropriate for it and be it a village hall then I'd rather have a beer festival in a village hall in a small town than not at all um, but yeah I think there's there's probably a, an eye for the market to, <clears throat> to try and find the funkier spaces to try and try and find something a bit more um, out there to go and, and host them in <laughs> um, and as for beer I, I, I completely agree I think um, it, it should be as wide and varied as, as possible because yeah. that's what we all drink beer for. We don't obviously none of us sit and uh, drink the same same beer pint after pint after pint. Um, that's a good point, Sam. I mean, you know, uh, Pete, I, I recall you writing lots of articles on beer festivals. And what's your what's your point of view on this subject? On festivals, um, I think festivals and tap rooms are linked because uh, people want. I mean, marketers talk about it being experiential. Uh, which is a horrible word, but it, it's actually true. Uh, what's driving the interest in beer at the moment among people who are interested in it is the fact this is something a bit different, it's out of the norm. 20 years ago when I was first working in beer, uh, you bought a beer based on which beer had the funniest TV ad. Yeah. Now, now beer doesn't have funny TV ads anymore. Uh, you, you find out about beer on your own terms, you find out about it at events and through social media and a combination of the two. And, uh, and I think... And, and it, the experience has got to be something out of the norm, it's got to be something special, it's got to be something memorable. And, um, and what I absolutely celebrate now is that we have a real big diversity of festivals to choose from. Uh, this time, about 10 years ago, me and Roger used to argue in the trade press about what the Great British Beer Festival, what camera beer festivals should be like and that kind of thing. And we reached peace when I think I wrote a piece <laughs> when, I, when I said uh, we should, uh, we, 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 all, all those of us who are pissed off with GBBF should just go and organise a different festival. And Roger wrote to me, exactly, that's what I've been telling you all along. You know, and, and you see these articles in, in the trade press now in, in August where it's like, which is best, GBBF or London Craft Beer Festival? Doesn't ma- why does one of them have to be best? You know, you can go to GBBF, and GBBF is what it is. It's what it's been for 30 years. We love it for its faults. We love it because it never changes, because the stupid rules about what beers can be there and what can't be there. And, it, and it's what it is, and it's GBBF, and I love it. And then the next day, I go to London Craft Beer Festival, and it's completely different. Uh, there's DJs, spinning decks, and all this kind of stuff. And they're totally different events, and each has its own thing. And I think that we can now choose from different events, and that's better for everybody. <laughs> Roger, do you want to come at this point? Well, I shall make a, a heretical point of view and say I think GBBF actually has to change. <laughs> change in the twenty first century. I thought that Olympia this year was a bit sad, it looked a bit tired, a bit obvious, and I think perhaps we need a different venue, I don't know. We may need to downsize a bit, we may need to take it round the country. I remember in the early days of camera. The festival was in Leeds, it was in Brighton, it was all, all, all over the country. So why don't we take it to other places? I mean, Birmingham, Coventry. I mean, the, the Winter Festival in Derby was an enormous success. So let's look around and see whether there might be better places for the great British beer festival. It doesn't have to be in London, for goodness sake. Um, <laughs> but I do think, I mean, many other festivals are, the camera festivals are changing very rapidly. <coughs> I went to the Cambridge Beer Festival last September. I've never seen queues like it to get in. Um, fortunately, because I'm a camera member, I got in through the back door. But <laughs> <laughs> um, the choice of beers was phenomenal. And of course, it wasn't just cask beer. Now, I will always raise the banner for cask beer. That's me. That's my DNA. I love cask beer more than anything else in the world. But I do appreciate in this day and age there are other types of beer now, and people want to drink other types of beer, and they were there available 
at Cambridge. They were available at the York Beer Festival, another very big beer festival. So camera is changing. It's a bit like a super tanker. It takes a long time to turn around, but it is turning around. But give us time, give us time. But I'm delighted by all the other beer festivals. I thought the, um, the Craft Beer Rising in London is, is a wonderful venue to go to, very exciting. Good to see so many young people there. Um, but they are shop windows. I mean, I live in St Albans in Hertfordshire, and the local beer festival there has about 350 beers from all around the country. How many people in St Albans can regularly drink beers from the Orkney Brewery, for goodness sake? So we are offering this amazing choice to local people, and long may we go on doing that. A quick question, uh, answer on tap rooms. I think tap rooms are fantastic because they allow people to see the wonder of beer being brewed. And I think one of the problems in this country is we take beer for granted. Oh, beer is that stuff we just go to the pub and drink. We don't realise that it's actually a very complex beer to make, drink to make. Much more complex than wine or cider, as a matter of fact. I was up at the Hawkshead Brewery recently. You can sit in the bar of the Hawkshead Brewery and you can see the beer being brewed through a glass wall. That, to me, brings beer closer to the people. So the more tap rooms, the better. Thank you, Roger. Roberto, do you have any questions? Sea beer festivals are a very interesting topic that's very close to me because having ran Stabbed Beer Festival only a mile away for many years and having been involved in recent years on picking beers in various capacity, it's very interesting and, and it's a shame that there won't be one next year. Now that's interesting because over the last few years the turnout has just fallen and there's no point you know putting on a great huge event, 90 plus volunteers to run the thing and then no one turns up. I remember about 10 years ago it was about, I'd been living in the Midlands for about five years at this point, got involved in camera, stuff like this. You know, there was a pub in Hell's Own, the Wagon and Horses, with 14 taps. That was a big deal. It's only 10 years ago, it's not long ago. Now it's quite commonplace to find pubs with massive variety, good quality, good variety. And so festivals, you know, where you've got masses of beers, aren't a great attraction when you can just go down the road and find a pub with 15, 20 beers. That's a festival in itself, really. So it's an interesting question. I think the future for festivals is they have to adapt. They have to be offering something different. Maybe, maybe downsize, like I said, be a bit tighter, be a bit more efficient, and offer not just 100, 4.3% golden ales or whatever, but something a bit more interesting. Otherwise, the attendance is going to continue to fall. There's not a camera festival in Birmingham. There wasn't one this year. I can name other, you know, camera festivals that aren't going ahead, and that's a shame. So it's a, it's a. So our, our local uh, uh, big uh, kind of camera festival is uh, the Pig's Ear um, okay. Festival in in Clapton <coughs> next weekend. Yeah, yeah. Um, next week, and um, the organisers they wind me up. That they really do. So they will say, like, Jager, I, I need something in cask, and we don't predominantly do huge amounts of cask. And, and they'll say, I want something new, something that's never been seen before, something that our customers have never had before. And if I don't offer them something new, they're like, well, we're not going to take it. So I have to make something specially for them. And this year, I've got my raspberry sour going into cask, and I've got our, our, our stout going into cask. And I've made one cask of each and it's going to that particular festival so but if they're doing that to me they're doing that to every single brewery that's supplying that festival which means the people that go to that festival are going to have a truly unique experience and try beers that they will probably not try anywhere else so and i think that's a really good thing uh, i think on the on the tap room and, and beer festival side of things so that's that's interesting as well because tap rooms are largely now um have take really good care of their beer. Mm -hmm. So uh, to cite, um, I've recently come back from Brew York's tap room where I think they've now got uh, 50, 50 keg, keg lines um, uh, and a few casks and that. And they're taking really good, uh, really good care of their beer. And, and I think largely uh, tap rooms across the country are doing that because obviously we make the beer, so we want to make it as good as it can be, um, which makes it equally as sad when you go to a beer festival and it's a line of casks in the heat with 20 tea towels over the top being dripped with water. Right. Larry, uh, you come from Liverpool, which has got a thriving... I come from a bit further north than Liverpool, but I, I live in Liverpool. I, I told you, anything past me... <laughs> <laughs> after you, after you. Yeah. 
Um, I come from so far north that English is technically my second language. Um, but for, for tap rooms, for me, uh, the, the purpose of tap rooms is to bring the, the drinking public closer to the beer that's, as it's being made. And with a tap room at Glenafric Brewery, um, you can sit in the tap room and you can see the brewery behind you. And, and there's, something, there's something a little bit special about drinking the beer feet away from where it was made. And you should never get beer in a tap room in poor quality because that should be the best possible iteration of that beer is because it's been like the, the food miles on that beer is is its feet rather than miles you know and, and the beer should never have been once it's finished fermenting it should never have risen above that temperature and it should be the best condition you should ever get that beer whether it's keg or cask or in small pack um, for festivals I really enjoy both volunteer-run festivals and festivals where the bars are staffed by people from the breweries. So when you go to Indie Man in Manchester, that, that is one of my favourite festivals, and, and Leeds Beer Festival, another one of my absolute favourites. There's a lot of brewers behind the bar there, and it's great to be able to talk to them about the beers that you're enjoying and all that. But then I went to ABV Fest in Belfast for the first time this year, and that was staffed entirely by volunteers, but with brewers present. And the idea there being the brewers can have a, a day off and go and enjoy the festival along with everyone else. So then you get to talk to them in a, in a more informal setting and they don't actually have to worry about running the bar themselves. So essentially, choice is good. And as long as something's well run and it's in a nice venue and there's some decent food available, which is very, very important, um, it, it's all good. I mean, choice and diversity, um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Early on, I, you know, I got a sense that actually, you know, pubs are starting to do festivals now, and there's a choice of beers all around the country. And, and Roberto, you said it's about the difference. Now, so as the one question to all of you is, what's the difference that will make the difference? What is that key, the essence of what we need to do differently, whether it's tap rooms, festivals, doesn't matter if it's volunteer led or brewery led. What is that? What's the key difference we need to drive forward so we engage with more customers? coming to tap rooms and beer festivals. A, a variety in beer choice being offered is, is mm. key. Because if, if, you, if you go to, whether it's a pub, doing a mini beer festival, and you go in there and every beer is between 38 and 4.2% and they're all golden and described as hoppy, that's not choice. <coughs> you know, you need to be able to provide options for people who want a dark beer. Maybe even, even on cask, a sour beer. Um, just some different things for different palates and make everyone feel that there's going to be something there that they want to drink. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah, there's a, there's a new Weatherspoons at St Pancras Station in London and if you look along the bar, it's just a session, one after another, of, of IPA's pale beers. And we do want to drink other stuff, types of beer. If you ask for stout, they'll, they'll point you to the Guinness font. Well, it's not the stout I want to drink. And I think we have to understand that there are other types of beer than just IPA, much though I love IPA. I'm not knocking IPA. I've written a book about the bloody subject, for goodness sake. But, <laughs> but uh, there are other types of beer. And I'm told that 2019 is going to be the year of the stout revival. So let's get behind that and have more dark beers. <laughs> um, I'd like to ship in on that. I mean, we, uh, we have 10 rotating beers on constantly, and Scott's here that does most of the ordering, speaks some others, most of the breweries. Um, but there have been times where I've just looked at him at 3 o'clock on a Saturday and just gone, why have we got no pale beer on the board? Why is it all <laughs> sours and stouts and impies? And where, where is that core market for that, that person that wants to drink the four or five percent pale? Um, and he just sort of shrugs and goes, they probably drank it all, so we've put something else on. Um, but that's what's great about it, is that we have such a diverse selection on the board. And um, I think the one, not that we're, we're particularly tap room because we're not tied, but the one thing that sells us the best is we never have the same beer on twice. Um, I mean, Wolf might, um, object to that because we get through a hell of a lot of cashmere by <laughs> Slopian but <laughs> um, we, we try to vary it up as much as possible and we, we try to deal with different breweries week in week out so whoever walks through the door doesn't have that same experience every time that they come in they, 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 yeah, I mean, and you can go for the tickers and the untapped and, and all the rest of it but even just the regular Joe Bloggs that likes beer enjoys the different um, the different styles that are on offer and for somewhere like crew I think we're, we're smashing it in, in being able to offer such a, a wide variety um, there was something else I wanted to say but I've, I've completely forgotten <laughs> so, um, oh it was sorry um, it was about you and um, events at tap rooms um, obviously 
when you're out in an industrial estate, it's harder to pull people in. Whereas when you have a bar on a high street or a main road or, or something, if you put events on, um, now we, we do do them, but I always find them that they're less accessible for customers. Um, our events probably get a really bad turnout in comparison to a normal night. Um, but I'm all for accessibility. I want people to be able just to walk in and if they want to sit upstairs, they can sit upstairs and not cut any section of the, the bar off to a private event that may, may require tickets. Um, I mean, we've never shut the shop since we've opened. We've been open every single day. And that is what I, I strive for, is that accessibility and that. Just, yes, if, if you want to go to the pub, you don't have to be disturbed by a band playing on a Saturday night or by a Meet the Brewer that's taking up half of it because you're not that interested. Um, but for tap rooms, I, 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 see the, I see the appeal for it because you have to try and drag customers to um, uh, an industrial estate that, like you say, isn't, isn't heated and uh, there needs to be some, some way of doing it. Um, and I think that's the way to do it. But unfortunately for us, I don't, I don't, don't think that's the, uh, the way forward. But obviously we're, we're different, different businesses and mm-hmm. you make the beer and we, we try and sell it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the best Cascale festival I've been to in recent years sums up a lot of the positives that people have said. Uh, and this may be a shock, but it was in Canada. <laughs> um, uh, so Cask Days in Toronto uh, is a Cascale festival, exclusive Cascale festival. Um, and like Jager said, the thing there is that Cascale is a novelty for these brewers, and for Cask Days, they're challenged with brewing a, a Cask. You, you don't normally do Cascale; it's Cask Days. You need to brew Cascale. They go, "Shit, what are we going to do?" And, and every single one of them does something special that they've never done before. Uh, it's held in a disused um, electrical substation with old machinery sitting around, and there's different rooms, and uh, there's, there's like green rooms, and, and you go through curtains, and you're in another little lounge space, and things like that. It's constant discoveries. You walk around the space. Uh, the crowd is incredibly young, it's incredibly diverse uh, in every single respect. Um, and there's queues through, the, the, they've got um, uh, people barriers outside, and the queue is one of those queues that just snakes like this, uh, and people queue for an hour to get in. And it's absolutely astonishing. And the thing about that is that it's a novelty there. <coughs> and I think if maybe we can't all go to Toronto next, uh, next September, <laughs> but if you can kind of look at what we do and sort of take a step outside it and forget that you know it and that it's familiar. Uh, the other best festival I've been to recently was the uh, Barcelona Beer Festival. And again, they're trying to copy GBBF, and they fail in copying GBBF, but they come up with something amazing <laughs> by, by copying it and getting it slightly wrong. Um, and, and their food there is astonishing. They've got cuisines from around the world that they pair with beers that are on the bars. They have a, a guest brewer bar away at different times of day. You can go up and meet the brewer from, from their beer, all sorts of different things. Yeah. Um, no. which is- Oh. It does occur to me that, that we're talking about two separate things here, aren't we? We're talking about um, commercial camera beer festivals and we're talking about things like the, the, the new wave of brewing. And I suppose if the question is how can you make a beer festival better, then surely it is to... to to, to do both at a single festival, and that is, I think, inherent of people like Cameron to, to say this is how we can make our beer festival more interesting um, and, and get more people coming to them. Because if, if, if Cameron doesn't modernise its beer festivals, then we'll be looking at you know, you know, large, organised beer festivals you know, like Stabridge, the Stabridge Lands, and the Birmingham, where people just don't turn up. I think the other the other issue, of course, is 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 logistics on a big beer festival it is just with, with cask beer is how difficult it is to present cask beer in a, a palatable and decent form uh, in, in a room that's at 80 degrees centigrade yeah. and separate it yeah. like, like we had a true beef beer festival this year it's, it's almost impossible but then again obviously it is the, the logistics to have 40 50 keg lines probably maintained is, is awkward as well uh, it, it, it almost sounds to be like yeah, yeah, we need more in, inclusion of styles, and, and I think certainly as, as we're talking about the difference between uh, uh, a, a bar and beer festival and a, a large public beer festival is, is, to, is to have as much diversity as possible. Um, Sure. Sure. Are, are we allowed to? <laughs> <laughs> of course you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, actually, I've been briefed that actually what we need to do is get a lot more audience participation. Um, please, crack on. 
Saying that, we, we think a beer festival should mix cast and cake. Um, I mean, we've done this in Birmingham uh, a few times recently. And from my experience, what seems to happen is the people that go to the festivals tend to gravitate more towards the cake because it's kind of promoted as that kind of festival. And the people who might want to drink the cast are maybe not going to be attracted to that kind of festival because they think it's going to be made of cake beer, which there's maybe camera members that are particularly approved on. Um, and so you end up with a lot of cake, uh, cat beer left. The end of the so obviously if you if you do a cake festival on the sort of cake beer left, I think you can, you know, book it and take it away and maybe, you know, serve it in your own bar or something like that. But with cat beer, after a certain amount of time, it just has to be chucked away. So the problem, as I see, is not just getting the two together, it's finding a way of getting, say, I mean, like, I can't think of a good term, but we'll call them hipsters, even though they're not the younger, hipsters, beers in shortage, drinkers who would drink in their hoppy IPAs. How are you going to get them to drink cast beer? And how are you going to get people who are uh, maybe old, like me, who like their cast beer, to suddenly go, oh, I hear, you know, this cake beer isn't for old balls, because it's rubbish, and some of it's quite good. And it's trying to find that. The answer to that is to have cask beer presented in its best possible quality by default. Okay. And, and a lot of beer festivals that focus on cask beer are dreadful. Yeah. Like If you go there on the trade session on a Thursday night, for example, you can have beer and it's in reasonable nick, but by the time it's get, gets rent a Friday evening, a lot of it's dead, a lot of it's flat, it's been over-vented, the, it hasn't been kept at the right temperature, yeah. and that is not the way to promote cask beer. Like, if, if anything, if you're going along and you're saying, oh, cask beer's great, and you go in there and you try some dull and lifeless pint, then you're like, well, this is awful. Yeah. I'm never touching this again. Yeah. And that doesn't do anyone any favours. doesn't do the brewer any favours. doesn't do the festival organisers any favours. I'd, I'd 100% agree with that. And, uh, and to sort of add to that a little bit, I think... Keg not 100%, but it is easier to. It's it's certainly easier to serve at the correct temperature. Yeah. Uh, cask is cask is obviously slightly harder, but I think more. Uh, I think more more needs to be spent on that. As I, as I sort of touched on earlier, you know, nobody's ever going to really believe that a wet tea towel is going to keep a cask at the right temperature for four hours. Um, but um, and and I think if you've got a, if you've got a keg and a cask bar, I think um, let's just following on the, the hipsters, you know, if you're, getting a, if you're getting a perfectly poured pint of cask, everybody's as happy as they are with yeah. keg. Um, but, if you, but if you're getting one that's poured at slightly better than the other, you're always going to go across to a better, a better format, aren't you? But you also, like I said, I think if, I mean, like I said, the couple of festivals I'm thinking of in Birmingham, it, it's kind of like people never even really look at them. Like, they never even think of them. Like, even though, you know, you might have, like, Gabe says, you might have a word with a bottle something special that you can cast for this one festival. But there seems to be a bit of a... Well, that's been a bit of a attitude because... I think there's a secondary issue there, is that so, so often now you get approached by a beer festival as a dinosaur cask beer producer of 20 odd years standing is that you, you won't get your beer in there unless you do something new for them. Yeah. Now, you know, my, my brew length is is 290 cast beer. I can't brew a, a specific beer yeah. for a beer festival. So, so, I, so I say, no, I'm not going to do it. A while back, we used to do your blend and whatever, and I look at it and say, no, if you don't want me for what I am, I'm not going to do it. Um, and it, and what's the idea of what Jaeger said about it, it produces something new and makes it more interesting? It, it doesn't always have to be that. And it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, a, a thing I struggle with personally, I must admit, that the, the, the <clears throat> beer cult of the new. If you go to a beer festival, everything has to be new and different. I, is that the experience we're really trying to promote? I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, do you want to comment? Um, my, my, my first, one of my first experiences um, in beer was at uh, Loughborough Beer Festival at the local Polish club, and that was where I got into beer. I just want to like, defend the role of, of, of camera generally ac across the country and just how dear it is and how inspiring it is to a lot of brewers. Um, and also not just in the UK, worldwide. If, if, if you travel um, uh, like to the US, to Australia, like people hold it with a certain reverence in terms of Caspian. I don't think we necessarily value it to the same level in the UK to which other people do. 
Um, I don't think any. I don't think there's any other company in the UK that can organise a cask beer festival the way that Canberra does. Um, I, I still. I still don't think there's anyone that does it as well. And yes, that yes, there are faults, and yes, there are things that can be improved. Um, <coughs> but. I still think that, that Canberra does it the best. I don't know if anyone has any other opinions on that. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. I think, in fairness to Canberra, there have been enormous strides in recent years to improve the quality of beer at beer festivals. Again, my local St Albans Beer Festival, in cask cooling, the beers are in very, very, very good condition for the whole of the week. And I know that similar things have been going on at GBBF for several years now. I think we have attempted to address the problem of cask beer being a perishable product has to be looked after very, very carefully. And I know at Olympia that the beers are kept off-site in very cool conditions until they're brought forward to be served. So I think it's a slight calumny to suggest that the beers are always awful at Canberra Beer Festivals. I think big strides have been made in recent years to make them much more acceptable. Okay, I think we've got a question from the audience. Right. There might be a question at the end of it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a contribution. I mean, I, I've been running beer festivals at a club and brewery for 20 years. I've worked at Worcester Camera Beer Festival. I've worked at Ludlow and seen the comp competition and the beer festival goes with it. So if anyone had an answer to what the answer was, I, I'd probably know why. Um, as we've observed, the beer scene is dynamic. It changes constantly. But... <clears throat> Jay's first comment about making a space for drinking beer convivial is exactly what right. you know, not just comfortable, <clears throat> but welcoming, feeling like you're in a space with other people like-minded, and both kinds of beer festival, craft and cast, are subject to the same like repelling factor. You get people deeply into that kind of beer, and they can form a clique, and it can feel unwelcoming to everyone. So somehow you have to craft that up. You have to make it um, every single opportunity, an entry level opportunity for someone who's never tried that experience before. So there must be beers that approach the mainstream. You know, there must be some people who've never encountered that kind of beer before can try without just putting it down and walking away. Um, the crowd in there somehow it has to be a mix of people. So, you know, you have to come across, you have to leave that barrier somehow. But the two beer festivals, that I remember distinctly as being enjoyable experiences for the first Birmingham beer bash where even Gaza was standing behind the bar serving and smiling. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and the other one was um, Zetos in Belgium where um, the whole beer festival is run. There's a sequence of brewery bars so pass from one brewery to another. Yeah. Every single one of them is competing for the customers, so they put on their very best friends, even towards the end of the evening. Um, but now they have chips and their names as well, which might be the secret. <laughs> the the, the, the single one. But, but overall, just as it would be the successful pub or any other kind of event, conviviality. Reminding people that beer drinking is mostly about being in an environment with other beer drinkers who would want to chat rather than look at their phones, checking on them taps. All the other crimes are guilty of. Um, <laughs> and um, and the only the only real disaster I remember I've been to some digital beer festivals was the one in Dudley that town centre about 25 years ago that nobody remembered but getting toilets. <laughs> <laughs> anarchy, anarchy approached after the time it takes people to drink three pints. Um, and that was really unpleasant. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, so unless, unless the question is how do you generate spontaneous good vibes in a beer festival, I'm, I'm just chipping in. Thank you very much. Do you have I think I've got an answer to that, um, or not, not quite an answer, but that you, you're sort of reiterating what my thought process is, is that the brewery-led festivals send either reps or brewers or wives of brewers or husbands of brewers or there's, there's a family there or, or everybody's there to go and sell their product and, and really push push the brewery, show what the brand um, or, the, or the brewery stands for, show them exactly how much passion they have in it, but at the end of the day, their mortgages and the dinner on the table all rest on whether or not they sell at that festival. Now, when you go to a volunteer-led festival, yes, these people like beer. Are they really as passionate about beer 
they probably like to think so, but none of them have got that inner working, or, or I'm generalising, but the majority probably don't have that inner working of what goes on behind the scenes, and they will just say, I don't know, here's Bateman's XB, it's my favourite, why don't you try it? And that's what they seem to push, whereas it, there's, there's um, I don't know, there's no objection uh, from volunteers, whereas there is from brewers, and they want to showcase their best products, and if they bring their own beer, then they know what they think they want to sell. Um, whereas if, if it's a volunteer-led festival, someone's picked it, and yeah, it could just be another beer, and the person in the bar has no idea what the brewery is, or what they stand for, or... I mean, breweries don't have to stand for anything, they just need to make beer, but um, it's always quite a good sideline, and it always, always helps. Um, but I, I think that's it, is... Uh, if, if, if you follow me, um, I think the fact that when you do have a brewery-led festival, the, the people selling it know everything about it, whereas when it is a volunteer-led festival, they, they don't. It's all a bit wishy-washy, and it's hard to engage on, on a level further than, yeah, it tastes nice, or no, it doesn't taste nice. Um, but that's just <coughs> my musings. That's why I was just going through in my head. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I was really going to say, the, they're like a department store for breweries. That's what brewery-led beer festivals are. Um, so they each have their own little area, and you can swan around and decide which one you like most and pick from it. Okay. Just jumping in very quickly on that, I, th I think you're right in, um, in that sometimes the, the, the brewer-led festivals have a, have a different scene than the, than the volunteer-led festivals. Um, what I think is sad sometimes is, uh, I, I, I don't know for the other brewers amongst, um, if you've been to a festival and you're, you're getting told by a, um, a volunteer that your beer's not ready or your beer's not correct and you're going, well it is, that, I, you know, that's how we want to present our beer. I mean that, that does have a dark side as well because I, I have also met brewers that have been... Uh, that have been so full on that they want to sell that beer that despite the fact that it's full of infection they're still telling you that it's <laughs> correct so you know there's there's both sides to that there's both sides to that coin but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think sometimes it, it tastes like TCP <laughs> yeah. what are you talking about <laughs> But, but I think sometimes, at least with the at least with the brewer-led festivals, and again, no no disrespect to to the camera-led festivals or the volunteer-led festivals, because I think they do an incredible job, and the passion there is is brilliant. Um, but at, at least you know that when it's a brewer-led festival, the, the beers that they're putting out uh, are the beers that exactly how they want them to be put out. I'm always inspired and awed by the um, volunteer-led festivals, and I don't mind the slightly surly service. <laughs> I'm fine with it, because that person's given their time for free, um, they've done all this work, they've made all the effort. Go for it. It's worth saying that boring beers are subjective, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's, what's <laughs> boring for some elitist attitude. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have, in my opinion, some of the best beers in the world, and you can't have 
some days, one bit that's from 30 years. Ooh, I like one for six seconds, all all these beers again this year. You need some more involved with the beer, the brewing community, and pumping to say, right, what do you need to order? Not just one day of the beer, like what beer vessel is that? It needs to be more of a collaborative effort for the beers that are going to be, are going to sell, but appeal to people, not what appeal to people 20 years ago. That's what some beer festivals like to be like. You walk in and think, oh yeah, what year is it again? And it's, um, it needs to be more brewers around the bar, brewers involved in the organisation, brewers in the actual buying the beer, brewers in there to ask that what Gene says, oh your beer's not ready. Well it is actually, yeah. That's how I want it. And it's, it needs to be more, not us and them, as in a lot of camera festivals, it needs to be more like it's us, again, to the people, not us and them. It's a more private effort. I think if you try and get all these things working together, not all individually trying to fight each other, that's one way it might, it might work. If you get all the different aspects of the beer festival and the brewing industry and the industry together, you might get a thing that actually does work with I think it's I think it's quite telling that at, at uh Indyman Beer Con and the Liverpool Craft Beer Expo also, they both started off with a fairly heavy representation of cask and they both pared it down the following year and essentially phased it out because there was so much wastage at the end of the festival. With, with a part keg of beer, you can potentially sell that off to a friendly local pub and they'll have it on the next week and then it'll be gone and, and you have that option. With, with cask beer, you need to sell it all. Um, other, otherwise, it makes the logistics of the festival almost impossible. Yeah, so there's a, a, a point to be made there, which I've been thinking about as we discuss this, is, is that there are too many cask beer festivals too big. Mm. Yeah. If, they, if they're to be run commercially, if we want to put on 300 or 400 or even 100 cask beers and you throw away half of it, it's, it's, you know, it's the same as we were discussing before, where you, you know, if you go into a pub and, or you, you, you're approached by a pub who says, I want to start off with 10 or 12 handfuls, and yeah, my yeah. instant response is, no, you should start off with two handfuls, get yourself some throughput and stop and, and not throw beer away and serve it as, in, 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 as, as well as it can be. Uh, are we, you know, going back to what we were talking about before, this idea that we have to have this huge selection of beer to have a successful beer festival, surely, well, to me, the, the presenting the beer as it as it should be presented in, in its best possible condition is, is is more important than that. And to, and the idea that I, they, they say that I, I also was thinking about what Gaz said about and my response to that about elitism, which it, it, obviously is nothing of the kind. But so many people that go to beer festivals are maybe going there for the first time, or they're not. You know, beer heads like the rest of us, and they'll look at you know, oh, that brewery. I've not tried that one before, and I've not tried that one before. And to not allow them that choice is, 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 is you are shrinking. But what is you're it trying to do? Is it that, or is it again down to is it again down to the beer buying, as sort of Gaz said, and a, and a lot of people have touched on? I mean, I, I agree with you that sometimes at the end of the festival, you've got a lot of uh, you've got a lot of beers left. Um, but Basingstoke Beer Festival is my favourite beer festival. I, I go to it every year. The beer section isn't necessarily the most diverse, um, but the, the Thursday, Friday, Saturday are all great. By the Sunday, you've got 30 beers that are very similar. Yeah. So is that down to is that down to the fact that you've ordered too many beer, too many beers, or you haven't ordered a, a diverse enough range? Or is it down to the fact that they're looked at as a commercial activity when maybe they shouldn't be looked at as a commercial activity? And if you have waste, you have waste. But then you might look at the brewers and say, well, do you want to su support us more in that way to say that you, you're putting your beer on as a showcase? Take some of the paint. Well, then you'd be Seba. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting. That there was a fascinating festival that was held in 2018. I think it was Affinity Brewery that, that held it. Um, uh, that was called Cask, and it was in Bermondsey, and it was um, each brewer got paid a hundred pound a cask, and it seemed to, to cross this line between the as, as the gentleman over there put it, that's the hipster crowd, and the um, and the kind of typical camera crowd. It seemed to cross that line. So you, so you had um, so you had brewers who typically would not make cask are suddenly financially incentivized to produce cast specially for this festival and and the festival was hugely hugely successful and i think that they're probably the only group that have managed to successfully do a festival on that scale and somehow cross this line um, between the between the two groups 
but we need to come together somehow. Yeah. I, I think that that's the only one I've seen. I don't want to <laughs> Tony, are we going to go on to talk about the problems of the cask beer sector? Because I... No, we will. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Can I yeah. say very quickly that I be very careful about talking about boring beer? Because what your, your idea of boring beer is not the guy next to you's idea of boring beer. There's a survey, I think, in the Morning Appetizer very recently showing that the most popular beer style in this country is still a good old-fashioned pint of bitter. I think so. it would be lager, surely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm talking about the ale sector rather than <laughs> the general sector. But um, in spite of the profusion of IPAs, pale ales, golden ales, uh, sours and all the rest of it, most punters go out for a good old pint of bitter in the pub it, and at the beer festival as well. So don't ignore those everyday drinkers. Yeah, I think um, it's something I've thought about quite a lot which uh, actually Gaz's point made me, made me come back to, is, uh, is remember the meaning of the word festival, you know? It's meant to be a celebration. It's meant to be an upbeat, energetic occasion, a break from the norm. You know, you, you have routine, you, you go to your local, you have a pint of the usual. You go to a festival, and all bets are off, you do something different. Mm. If I go to a music festival, it's not a good music festival unless I've been to see bands that I've never heard of before and come away going, they were amazing. Why haven't I not heard of them before? I need to go and get all their, all their CDs. Um, and I've been to some beer festivals where you walk into the room and there's just blokes standing like this. <laughs> just kind of like, it's like, shh, you know, <laughs> we're in a library. And, and it, it should be a celebration. And, and so if people are putting in very run-of-the-mill beers, if the beers aren't special, if... If the, and it's not just that, what I was going to say was think about everything else as well. Think about, not, obviously it's important to make sure that you've got the best beers on the bar in the best quality possible. But I think if that's all you're doing, you're missing the point of the festival. There has to be an atmosphere, an environment, something around it that makes you just go, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to remember this, I'm going to tell my mates about this. And that's why Indie Man Beer Con is probably the most well thought of festival in the UK right now, because it's a kind of venue you would never have thought of, you would never go to otherwise. We're in a bloody swimming bath drinking beer. Wow, look at this. Look at these tiles. This is amazing. And there's little grottos and things like that and rooms that you discover and stuff. Um, so th I would just say think about more than the beer. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, right, I know there's a lot of empty glasses. I can see them here. Um, great to take some questions from the audience or some comments from the audience. Sir, did you Yeah. Um, I think my, my experience at the beer festival of January is uh, 25, 25 years ago, the first festival, it was all branded, it was lit, it was pails and stuff, but as I've grown older, my tongue's got a bit different, and I like different beers, and uh, when I go to a festival now, I do look for the, you know, the fruity beers, like the, the unfined beers, it's more unfined beers now, but I had a festival recently, and I got slated by camera, camera people, on Facebook saying, I'm going to the festival, Brendan's again, because he always be a bit of I'm thinking, Brendan well, explained to him what it's all about, you know, they just don't understand that uh, they're going to find beer. But they don't want to, they don't want to know, he, he, he said, he made him ill. He, he, you know, on paper, he said, oh, he's made me ill. I don't think he's a beer person. So, the thing is, to, it's, I think about education, explaining the unfined beer, they've got no animal products in it, it's ethical, you know, it's well, not ethical, but it's, it's a different concept. It, it's, you just take away your eyes and just use your mouth and your nose, and that's what it is. But it's, it's so hard, really, to try. I mean, we, I don't want to sell another unfined beer. I don't want to sell unfined beers, because that's what I really like. It's wild, uh, wild, uh, oh, sorry. Wild weather. Wild weather, yeah. Well, where the well load your beers, and they're all cloudy, they're all hazy, you know what I mean? But try it, and you've got massive bumpy climax right to the middle of it. <laughs> and they kind of, oh, no, but I know they're all, and I'm thinking, yeah, that's why they do it, because they want to be different, they're different people. So, what I'm going to say is, to have a good festival for me, to come off the keg now, because all the good ones now on keg, I love my stouts, 12, 15, 16%. I love the big beers, I love the big tastes, I love something absolutely, I mean sour, I couldn't start, then all of a sudden, I love sours. I just want to be out there drinking different beers, but when I go to a festival now, I never get that in a castle. And my, my suggestion would be to offer more pins 
you know what I mean? Yes. So the more people, so you don't have to sell a whole one, you can have 200 beers, but really well, 100, but you know, I'm not off them, the big beers. I mean, if you're a festival, the first one sells out, is the big beer, you know? You go in there for four hours, you ain't going to get that 10% because it's gone. And so, if you had a few more of those beers, I think people are going to get better first of all. And also, the last point, is there's nothing wrong with having a care of the craft, and even a jeep, the wine. Because it's a tenement was lacking. Not, you know, bums, bums on seats are lacking. But it's everyone, if you put a bit more things in there, you can bring your wife a better street. Yeah. You should have a glass of wine at the same time. I think um, one thing that we haven't addressed is how volunteer festivals are marketed. Like obviously every, anyone in the industry knows that you have to market a product and you have to, to flog it to death. Um, and it, it, it made me laugh because um, you've reminded me of something that I'd, I'd forgotten all about. I went to the Birmingham Beer Festival a few years ago to meet my father and some of his work friends uh, who were just down there on a Thursday night. So I got the train by myself, we went, had a few beers, um, and I was stood having a beer, and I don't remember this picture being taken at all, but I was stood having a beer with a guy called Amish that worked with my father, um, and we had a great night, came home, yada, yada, yada. Next year, I am the only picture stood next to Amish on the Birmingham beer poster. Um, there's just a picture of me and him stood there having a beer, and it seems like we met a diversity criteria for them. It was someone young and Amish. But it, 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 it was bizarre. The, the, the leaflet and the posters that were in the local didn't really have anything about the styles of beer that would be there. It just said 500 beers, big picture of me, and Birmingham Beer Festival. And I sat there and went, well, that's just a bit weird. I don't, I don't really understand that. Um, so I think, although, like um, Jaeger said, that they are all volunteers, and, and you, you've got to really tip your hat to that, that they, they put in all this time and work and effort for, for absolutely nothing. Um, maybe the marketing needs a bit of a kick up the backside and maybe they need to explain slightly more what they're about and what they're doing and, and get out there to people, um, even if it's flyers or posters or leaflets, um, because having a picture of someone that may fit the description of a hipster um, to try and draw in a younger crowd is, is just stupid. <laughs> um, that's about all I've got to say. <laughs> OK, before we break, do we have any other comments or questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Surely, um, that's surely like the same as being in a band. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Jaeger will, will attest to the same thing. Like, you know, you're not just paying fifteen pound to you're not just paying fifteen pound to go and try these fantastic beers. I mean, you're paying fifteen pound to try these fantastic beers, look after the people that have that have been good enough to put on the festival, pay the bands that are there, maybe give a little bit of money to uh, to some of the stalls that are there. So, you know, I'd, I'd quite happily pay £15 for an independent gig. I mean, thankfully, you don't have to very often. It's usually like seven quid or something like that. But I'd, I'd, I'd pay £15 to go to an independent gig. So why wouldn't I pay £15 to go to a gig to see a load of bands and have the pleasure of that incredible beer selection? Yeah. Beer's, beer's just beer. Beer's a commodity. Music is, you know, the band and sort of, you know, it's the arts. And but they're usually, to, they're usually together. How could you say that? 
<laughs> Beer is just a commodity. <laughs> <laughs> I don't eat it, I don't eat it. I would happily pay when you go to a festival, you'll pay something more. Yeah, you can go to that. Yeah, you know, it's the black ladies of those producers and it's not black, it's just real beer. 
I don't see why there's an exclusion. There shouldn't be an exclusion. We're all in the industry together. We all look at the product that we, that we sell. We all look at the product that we make. I just, I just think that there's so much going on about what should we call it, what should we, you know, and heads butting all the time, when it should just be so much more inclusive. And I think the, the words we have here just, just sum it up as it's easier for everyone. You know, it's, as someone who sells a lot of head beer, but loves cask beer as well, you know, if, if you're going to have a festival that does everything, why isn't it? It, it, it just seems crazy that there's this big head book that yeah. brings everyone together. But you can't have that until until everybody agrees. That's the problem. I, mean, I, I think even the craft beer community largely yeah. dislike the term craft beer. But you can't have a you can't have a real beer until we agree that the CO2 blanket should be allowed on kegs, kegs should be allowed to be gassed and not necessarily separated in a bag. And until we all agree that the product in your glass is the product in your glass, and if it tastes fantastic, that's great, then uh, then we can't have that, unfortunately, can we? And I I think camera has to take a lot of responsibility for this divide. I really do, and um, and I think camera has the potential to heal this divide between the two. Yes. Kids with Peter cartoon. Folks, folks, I think this is very poor for me, but we're about 20 minutes over. <laughs> 20 minutes over. So can I suggest that we fill our glasses, there's a lot of empty glasses here. Why don't we we'll get a drink and we put that close as we can to our class. Okay, and we'll talk about next subject.